Hello everyone. Welcome to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilopathology.com. The topic which I'll be discussing today is H pylori associated gastritis. So this is the overview. We will just discuss the normal anatomy and histology of stomach. We will look into the various protection factors of the gastric mucosa and then in detail about H pylori associated gastritis under these various headings. Now let us see the normal uh, anatomy and histology of the stomach. As we all know, the stomach is divided into four parts, right? The cardia, fundus, body and the pylorus. So if you cut open the stomach, what you see is the gastric rogue and then depressions. And these depressions in the stomach uh, mucosa are called as gastric pits. And then these are the deeper parts of these pits which are nothing but the gastric glands. So if you look into the histology of these gastric glands, let us see the histology of the gastric glands in the fundus or the body, which is mainly auxintic glands. The main, the, the important cells which you see in this type of glands are the chief cells which secrete the digestive enzymes like pepsinogen, the parietal cells which secrete the gastric acid, and then you have D cells and enterochromaffin cells. D cells are the ones which secrete somatostatin and enterochromaffin cells which secrete atrial natriuretic peptide. Similarly, if you look into the histology of the pylorus, these are pyloric glands wherein you find the D cells, again as I told you, which secrete somatostatin. The G cells are the ones which are very important, which are the ones which secrete gastrin. And then you also have enterochromaffin cell. Okay, so remember the G cells are present in the pyloric gland, whereas parietal cells are present in the auxintic gland. So normally what really happens is these G cells are the ones which secrete gastrin and this gastrin, you know, is the one which stimulates these parietal cells to produce acid secretion. But then again, you have D cells next to these G cells, which secrete somatostatin, which is a negative regulator of gastrin secretion. You know, they sort of inhibit these G cells to reduce the secretion of gastrin. Thereby, it prevents the secretion of acid by these parietal cells. So let's look into the normal defense mechanisms. Why do we need to understand these defense mechanisms? So we know that the stomach, you know, the mucosa contains acid and this acid, the pH of this acidic environment is close to one. That's way more than what you see in the blood. Okay. And that has the potential to cause damage to these epithelial cells. But then normal gastric mucosa has protective factors. And what are those protective factors? The first and the foremost thing is that the mucus secreted by the foveolar cells. Okay. It forms a layer above the epithelial cell, above the gastric epithelial cell, which prevents the acid from being diffused into the epithelial cell. The second one is the bicarbonate ions, again secreted by the surface epithelial cells, which sort of neutralize the acid. acid. The third important mechanism is the gastric epithelial cells themselves forming a physical barrier and that limits back diffusion of acid. The fourth one being epithelial regeneration. You know, the gastric epithelial cells, they are replaced every three to seven days. The fifth one is the rich mucosal vasculature. You know, what does that do? That delivers oxygen and removes acid, which may have diffused into the lamina propria. And the last one is elaboration of prostaglandins E2 and prostaglandin I2. Now, what does this do? This is the one which is responsible for all the above actions. You know, the secretion of mucus, the bicarbonate ions, epithelial regeneration, even vasculature. All these are brought about by these prostaglandins E2 and I2. So, and if, if any of these these defense mechanisms are damaged due to various injurious agent and that results in the development of gastritis or gastropathy. Gastropathy is inflammation of the gastric mucosa where the inflammatory cells are very minimal or even absent whereas gastritis are the ones which have inflammatory cells in the form of neutrophils. Okay, that's why that's why you need to understand the difference between gastritis and gastropathy. Now let us see what H. pylori does. How does this organism injure the gastric mucosa? Now, what is this Helicobacter pylori? These are slender curved rods with polar flagella. Okay, one 
end of these bacilli contain multiple flagella and these are the ones responsible for rapidly i mean rapid motility by the action of this flagella they are gram negative bacilli and remember they are the only human bacteria to persistently inhabit the gastric mucus and they are the sole non drug cause of gastritis and gastric and duodenal ulcers and they cannot colonize duodenum or esophagus unless they have undergone gastric metaplasia normally most of the h pylori are free living in the mucus okay uh, we know that the organism from the luminal aspect enters into the mucus layer by motility due with the help of these flagella polar flagella so most of the h pylori are free living in the mucus a very small portion of h pylori is adhered on to the underlying gastric epithelial cell this is a gastric epithelial cell and at mucosa this adhesion is mediated or brought about by the outer membrane proteins of the h pylori right and where do they adhere they bind to the blood group antigen particularly the levi's b blood group antigen which are expressed on the gastric epithelial cells so these outer membrane proteins bind to the blood group antigen and in some parts of the world you know this h pylori also have evolved some proteins b a b a to bind to bind blood group o antigen at best this organism has unique bacteriologic features let us uh, see what are these unique bacteriological features one is a flagella we all know that that is the one which is responsible for its motility thereby the organisms moves or swim to the less acidic locale beneath the gastric mucus and the second one is urease and this urease is the one which generates ammonia which increases the ph and allows the organism to persist in the low ph environment okay the urease is the one which increases the ph the third one is vacuolating cytotoxin a in short it is referred to as vaca a vac a which is a cytotoxin and the fourth one is cytotoxin associated gene a or cag a so let us understand th this basic i mean this cag a is basically pro inflammatory and pro proliferative now let's understand in detail about these two bacteriologic features as i told you once there is adherence of bacteria to surface epithelial cell it forms a transmembrane channel and through the channel the vaca and cage are released into the gastric epithelial cells right the vaca are the ones which, which is a toxin we know that it is a cytotoxin that forms channels in the lysosomal end and endosomal membranes thereby generating multiple large cytoplasmic vacuoles so vac a also results in alteration of the t cell function now, now moving on to the cag a cag a is the one which causes reorganization of actin filaments and also stimulates cytokines and this stimulation of cytokines is the one which leads to recruitment of inflammatory cells towards the site of injury or towards the site of organism now with the combined effect of all these things you know formation of vacuoles reorganization of filaments alteration in t cell function and then recruitment of inflammatory cells is basically acute or chronic inflammation that is gastritis and gastric epithelial death you know these cytoplasmic vacuolation induces apoptosis in the gastric epithelial cells and causes gastric epithelial death which leads to the formation of gastric ulcers so that's how gastric ulcers are formed now vac i mean the cage is also this the interaction of this cage also leads to growth promoting oncogenic signals and that's how there is development of gastric cancer so that's about the cag a which is responsible for the development of gastric cancer see the vac is the one which has immunosuppressive effects which which results in immunosuppressive effects and that is the reason why you know there is not much natural immunity to these h pylori organism much h pylori infections now we know that most of the world population is affected by h pylori particularly the developing countries where there is low socio economic status and um, you know improper hygiene condition majority of the individuals are infected by h pylori but not all individuals colonized by h pylori develop disease only 15% of them develop disease so that means 
85% of the individuals who have colonized bacteria do not develop disease. So the pathogenesis depends upon the virulence, which we already have talked about, right? The Kage, the Wake, and the Babe. We know the Babe is the one which are responsible for the addition. Wake is a cytotoxin. Kage is a pro-inflammatory and pro-proliferative protein. The second important one being host genetic susceptibility. That's very important because, you know, if the individual has polymorphisms in human cytokine genes, particularly interleukin-1, which are basically pro-inflammatory. So polymorphism in these set of genes makes the individual more susceptible to the development of inflammations. And the third one is the environmental cofactor. Uh, you know, for example, being smoking is one of the important environmental factor which damages the gastric mucus thereby resulting in the breach of the normal mucosal defense mechanisms and H. pylori can infest very easily, right? So the pathogenesis depends upon the virulence, host genetic susceptibility and environmental or environmental cofactors. Now, why some develop gastric ulcers and uh, some others or few develop duodenal ulcers? Let's understand this mechanism. Normally, we know this, right? The G cells release gastrin and this gastrin stimulates the production of acid by the parietal cells. And D cells, the somatostatin is a negative regulator of the G cells. That's a normal mechanism, right? Now, what happens in H. pylori infection? H. pylori results in decrease in D cells. So, decrease in the number of D cells results in decreased somatostatin production and that what happens if there is decreased somatostatin production the normal inhibitory effect of the d cells is lost so what does that result in that results in continuous stimulation of g cells continuous secretion of gastrin by these g cells right so there will be increased release of gastrin the second important mechanism being inflammation. Inflammation directly, they stimulate G cells to produce more and more gastrin. Now, we have a condition called hypergastrinemia. Now, what happens after that? So, two things can happen. One, depending upon the type of gastritis involved. One, if the gastritis involved is predominantly corpus or pan gastritis or if the gastritis involved is anteral predominant gastritis. So, two, two entities. One is pan gastritis, the entire gastric mucosa is infected or affected or second one is antral predominant gastritis. So in corpus predominant gastritis, there is decreased acid production. That's because even the parietal cells are damaged. There are no parietal cells resulting in acid production, decreased acid production and leading to gastric atrophy. Okay, And this gastric atrophy over a period of time results in gastric ulceration and gastric carcinoma. Now, if it is an antral predominant gastritis, what really happens is that there is increased acid production because of hypergastrinemia. This gastrin goes and stimulates the normal parietal cells to synthesize more and more gastric acid. So, there is increased acid production which is transported to the duodenum thereby resulting in damage to the duodenal mucosa resulting in duodenal ulcer. So, this is the mechanism of formation of gastric and duodenal ulcers. Now, we saw that the H. pylori induces gastric atrophy, right, which progresses to adenocarcinoma. Remember, even if H. pylori is treated, now, how is this gastric atrophy implicated in the development of adenocarcinoma? Let's understand this. The gastric atrophy results in increased reactive oxygen species and that's because of more and more inflammatory cells already present in the gastric mucosa. Second one is, it might result in overgrowth of other bacteria. Third one, there is loss of sonic hedgehog expression. Now, what is this? This normally is the main cause of cell polarity. So, whenever there is the sonic hedgehog expression is the main cause of cell polarity, whenever there is loss of sonic hedgehog expression, so that exposes these cells to mutagenic agents. So, the combined effect of all these three is increased risk of development of gastric adenocarcinoma. Now, you understood the concept of how gastric atrophy is implicated in adenocarcinoma, right? So, increased reactive oxygen species, overgrowth of other bacteria and loss of sonic hedgehog expression. Now, what are all the clinical features of H. pylori associated gastritis? Nausea, upper abdominal pain, if there is associated peptic ulcer disease and that leads to nausea, anorexia, vomiting, epigastric pain, belching, etc. Some 
individuals can be asymptomatic for decades you know and perforation can be a complication which can lead to extensive bleeding and peritonitis now how do you diagnose h pylori infestation most important and the most sensitive one is endoscopy and then do a biopsy and then the culture of gastric mucosa that is the most sensitive method of diagnosing h pylori and there are non invasive methods like serology and urea breath test serology you know you identify the antibodies in the serum igg and ig antibodies urea breath test what do we do here there is you know the patients are allowed to ingest these labeled urea carbon 13c and 14 carbon labeled urea we know that the urease is produced by h pylori right and this urea this urease results in labeled carbon dioxide which appears in breath that is estimated that's a urea breath test stool antigen detection test is done which is a sensitive indication indicator of colonization special stains can be done on these uh, biopsy uh, sections which can be gemsa stain normally H even hnd you can see h pylori but then the special stains which are done are the gemsa difquick wadin starry stains you can do immunohistochemistry in difficult cases and specifically it is you know advised after uh, therapy where h pylori is not identified easily lastly molecular techniques you know by means of polymerase chain reaction now this is a hnd uh, section where you can find look at this in the luminal aspect you can see free floating slender curved bacilli that's a special stain gemsa stain showing these h pylori organism the third one is the wartin starry stain which is showing these multiple organisms the last one is the immunohistochemistry for h pylori so all these are uh, taken from the beats from these pathologists now what are the sequelae of h pylori infestation we all know that it can cause gastritis now it can also results in ulcer peptic ulcer gastric and duodenal ulcer and adenocarcinoma right that's what we saw and intense inflammation with lymphoid follicles and prominent germinal centers can be seen they represent mucosa associated lymphoid tissue you know and these have the potential to transform into malignant lymphomas thus h pylori associated chronic gastritis is associated with both increased risk of both gastric adenocarcinoma and lymphoma okay so so what are all the conditions you can expect uh, with h pylori infestation it can cause gastritis it can cause gastric ulcer or duodenal ulcers it can cause gastric adenocarcinoma and it can cause gastric lymphoma now how do you treat h pylori infestation there is 90% of cure rate with quadruple drug therapy which is given for 14 days the combination includes bismuth subsalicylate proton pump inhibitors tetracycline and metronidazole earlier they they used they used to give triple drug therapy but now it is seen that it is shown that it is very less effective now prophylactic treatment is it is it indicated prophylactic treatment of asymptomatic persons even if they are found to have colonized by h pylori this is not recommended so that's about the h pylori associated gastritis we talked about the normal anatomy and histology we did discuss about the protective factors and then we talked about the epidemiological aspects the pathogenesis the clinical features morphology diagnosis and treatment hit the like button if you have liked this video do comment if you have any queries don't forget to subscribe and do share if you find this video useful i'll be coming out with another interesting topic in gastrointestinal system shortly stay tuned thank you